little bit about me. I run a company, creativelab.tv. I invest in startups. I help them with uh, getting their web and mobile apps up and running, so mostly tech startups. And then I also spend a lot of time coaching executives, helping them think more clearly and helping them with self-mastery. And we'll get a little bit into that. And there's two parts to this program today. One is kind of rough and tough startup, and the other is all about self-mastery. So two minutes of startup training right off the bat. Three things that suck. The first thing are NDAs. If you're a startup founder and you are bringing a non-disclosure agreement to every one of your pitches, you are going to make a lot of people very upset. If you're living in 1973, then I think an NDA is very acceptable. But today, leave that at home. Um, kitchen sink pitches. Whenever I'm hearing startups talk about their businesses and then by the 20th slide, they're getting into the 26 other revenue centers, including infusing cannabis somehow in their product and they're gonna be opening offices in Dubai. I know they're just jerking me off. So please be crystal clear about what you're offering when you're running your startup and you're giving presentations. Get to the point, tell me how the business model works and most importantly, tell me why you're such an amazing person that should be the CEO of this company. And the number one thing that I think really suck are lawyers. And uh, I mean that lovingly. Um, so lawyers tend to complicate things and they literally see you, like I've got buddies in New York who are lawyers, they see their clients as little ATMs, just pressing a button and getting some cash. That's how they see it. And they wanna bill you for every breath. So I get very upset when startups are bringing on lawyers so early. I think it's a mistake. If you're hiring a lawyer at an early stage, that is like buying a Porsche so you can deliver pizzas. Leave the lawyer at home. Ask business friends. You can copy and paste agreements. It's really simple. And then when things start cooking, you pay somebody 400 bucks an hour to make it perfect. But you don't do that without revenue. It's silly and it's egoistic. So here are the top five things that founders do that drive me nuts. Drive me, maybe make me just nuts when I see this, especially in the ones that I invest in. They hire all their buddies. They sign two-year leases with an office. And they get everybody matching ergonomic chairs for their desks. That drives me crazy. They constantly congratulate themselves with a focus on the positive. Now, I love being positive, but the truth is, if we focus on the positive, we're just gonna be edifying ourselves and gratifying our ego, and we're not gonna see the cracks in the foundation. It's vital to have a positive ad uh, attitude and feel love and goodness in your heart, but you have to be grumpy. You've gotta be looking at every aspect of that model of that team. And three, they broadcast company pl plans to anybody with a pulse. Now, one of the laws of the universe is that if we talk about something so much before we fully execute, well, guess what? Psychologically, we're going to actually feel as though we already accomplished it. So don't talk about your genius ideas until you've perfected them, until they're ready for market, until you're ready to tell the story to investors. You're wasting your energy, you're gratifying your ego, and you're going to hurt that product plan in the long run. Um, expect the company's first product to deliver, a comp deliver company sustaining revenue. I love this, you know, these pitches where they're like, well, as soon as we get the $750,000, we are going to make the product, distribute it, and have uh, full-blown clients. And by month four, we're going to be fully sustaining ourselves. That never happens. Most startups have to pivot twice and almost collapse twice before they actually gain the traction necessary to sustain themselves. And the number one thing I see in startups is they all want to hire their buddies. They're like, yeah, brah, he's my brah, and we're going to do really great things together, man. And then when I ask what their buddy does, their bra, they're like, well, we're not sure yet, but it's really good to have him here at the office. It's not good to have him there at the office. Get rid of your friends. Stick with people who can execute. You can hire your friends later to be your personal servants when you're making coin. Here are the 10 things that newly founded funders do that make them rock stars. Networking intelligently is the most important thing and spending more time worrying than partying. When I'm talking to my founders and they're just so happy and excited, I'm thinking, what, what, what is this guy doing with my money? He's too happy. This guy should be up all night. He should be chewing his fingernails. They work, work hard on building real products versus jerking off investors, giving us false re reports. They assemble strong co-founder teams, and this is really important, which drastically increases their chances of success. It's all about the team. There's nothing more. The product could even suck. You can improve a product. You can't improve people in most cases. They wait a few weeks before spending any money. 
And that means they're vetting their plans one more time. They're checking with their advisors to make sure everything's cool. And they engage two to three advisors, older folks like myself, and they say, I've got questions today. I need your help. Can we meet for coffee? So many founders are talking to their fellow 23-year-old green kids that are eating ice cream all day and smoking pot, and they're not talking to adults. Talk to adults who've gotten their ass kicked. Number five, at the start, they only hire a few contractors. I love this. Start slow. Don't hire 10 people at once. Hire a couple of people part-time to see how they're going to fit into your worldview. They quickly become tough, tenacious insomniacs. I love seeing my CEOs start to deteriorate a little bit, like they're nervous and they're like, oh my God, I got this. I love that. It means they're taking it personally because business is personal. It's not impersonal. Business is personal. You got my money, it's personal. Number three, they readily pivot upon compelling intelligence. I see so much of this in, in CEOs. They're so hooked. It's like heroin. They're like, yeah, man, my vision is everything. No, man, your vision is nothing because there's no intelligence behind it. As soon as there's emerging intelligence, pivot. Move quick. Iterate. Do it quickly and test it. See what happens. Don't sit there pontificating on an old vision because the past is a canceled check. Number two, they reject admiration and ass kissing, and they don't bring along people that do the same. They want people to think critically and not to be spending most of their time developing their ego. And the one, number one thing that rock star founders do is they spend most of their time learning from and onboarding customers through customer discovery, which means they never mention the product through three interviews, simply learning about pain points. All right, now on to the potent stuff. I know we're all fascinated with our phones right now and our computers, and it's really awesome, and oh my God, I'm gonna send my friend a picture of my left toe. But I'd like to do something that's a little adventurous. Would you all join me in something adventurous? Yes. I would like everyone to stand up. I love it, you're standing up, we're getting along great. All right, now the next thing we're gonna do is pretty cool, and I'm asking you to have some courage. Can we all have some courage? Yes. All right. So first of all, I want to tell you that each and every one of you is the embodiment of love. You are born from stardust. You have stardust in your bones. You have love infused in your conception and birth. And you are filled with goodness. Here's the challenging part. I would like you to pick three people that you do not know, and I want you to look into their eye and very slowly and thoughtfully say, I know that you are the embodiment of love. Are you willing to do that? Yeah. On the count of three, one, two, three, go. <laughs> I know that you are the embodiment of love. I know that you are the embodiment of love. I know that you are the embodiment of love. I know that you are the embodiment of love. All right, good job. Back to your seats, have a seat. They're gonna shut my mic off in like 12 minutes. They're very tough here, very tough. How did that feel to everybody, that feel okay? Isn't that kind of nice though? Aside from the grumpy guy who should really write in his journal in front of me. Did I feel all right everybody? I'm grateful you tried that, thank you. All right. So I've toured the world three times, I've had venture partners that own islands, I've invested, I've raised millions, I'm fascinating, and I really find it kind of disgusting. And at some point in my life, I left everything, and I needed renewal. So with my 40 awards and five Emmys and all these fascinating partners, I gave it all up. I gave away all my belongings, and I moved to the wilderness in northern New Mexico, and I studied with a Native American shaman. I learned healing techniques, I learned rituals, I learned how to heal others, and I learned how to embody the light and love that is infused in every particle in the universe. And so, 
After my first meeting with the shaman, he says, you need to go to the woods for four days in the wilderness with no food, and you need to take your clothes off and start praying. And I said, that sounds awesome. So I sat about 20 miles from the nearest uh, public area, deep in the Pecos wilderness, and I sat and I meditated and I prayed, and I cried and I let go of things and I forgave people and I pounded the earth in anger and I gave up every piece of negative emotion that I possibly could so that I could then refill with the love of the divine that is our birthright. And after doing that for four days, on my way back to my truck, a bear, this bear, showed up in front of me. And I was so clean and clear and filled with love that the bear thought, this is my friend. So the bear and I began to wrestle. And I am very scared, but he's having a lovely time. And he was very cute and he's sniffing me and then at some point he stopped and he realized, wait a second, this motherfucker is not a bear. The fool fooled me, what is going on here? And he got very standoffish and I got scared and I said, look, everything's cool. I want you to go over there and he's like, all right, you get moving because you're not a bear, you big pussy, get out. So I had this beautiful experience of feeling connected and I took that back to my life and it was quite lovely. And here's what I found when I brought it back to my business life, this kind of rejuvenation. So startups fail because CEOs are unable to look at themselves honestly. They refuse to get over their tough and brilliant vision. And they have unprocessed emotions. They have inflated egos. They don't know how to listen. And that means they're not gonna succeed to the degree that they can. And I don't know what that says, but I think it says what the prior slide says. You know better than me. Cool. So everybody can master loyalty, love, and forgiveness. And everybody can be strong and present when they're with others, when they're running a company. It doesn't matter if it's business or their personal relationships. Self-mastery helps everything. We can't create quality relationships or empower others, and we're not going to know when to iterate with our startup if we don't pursue self-mastery. We miss things. We have a little negativity, and we refuse to be receptive and that blocks our ability to succeed. It all comes down to self-mastery. Now I've raised millions, several profitable exits, amazing mentors, outstanding partners, people who own islands. I'm a very lucky, lucky person. I, I couldn't have done it without all the help. But here's what I found. The big lesson, all the adventures, wrestling bears and business and in the woods, all these adventures are fragile, they're temporary, and they're relatively meaningless without love and grace, defending love and grace. Did I do good on that one too? All right, super, cool. We know that love is the most important part of our, part of our lives, but what about grace? What is grace? Where does grace come from? Well, first of all, it's the unbridled outpouring of soul changing bliss. It somehow exists in the universe. And the big question becomes, how do we get it to open our hearts, lighten difficult situations, and inspire an enduring peace? How can we experience grace? And we do that by loving, by forgiving, by being loyal, by serving others, by defending goodness in everything we do. Defending it against the negativity, defending it against the egos and the selfishness standing tall for goodness, and in this case, it builds your virtue. Our virtue triggers outpourings of grace, and grace comes from eternal love, which is how the universe was born. It might also be called eternal light, divine consciousness, energy, or even God to some people. Grace changes time, space, and outcomes for all living beings, and grace is how miracles are born. Now, what are miracles? They're mind-blowing, instantaneous circumstances born from deep substratum intentions that drastically improve our relationships, conditions, attitudes, and vibrations. We all have the opportunity to live fully embodied in grace and love and create miracles. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in others' lives. 
It just takes focus. So this is how you were born. You're a miracle. Your families are miracles. Your partners, your businesses, all miracles. When we're vulnerable, miracles happen. Being vulnerable, we honor our miracle natures. Being vulnerable, we honor our families, partners, and teams. And we attract and create miracles. And it takes a miracle, oftentimes, to get a startup going. Who would agree with that? Right? Doesn't it feel like you need a miracle? Well, I've seen them happen, and I believe in it. Vulnerability is good for business. It takes courage to be vulnerable. I believe in miracles, and I believe in vulnerability and defending that vulnerability. Don't let anybody talk you down or dishonor your goodness and openness. Defend it. Stand tall. Be proud of your open heart and your vulnerability. We're all this age. Everybody in this room is this age. There's not one person here that's not this age. It's just how we are emotionally. We just forget how to access it, and we forget to bring it into business. We become flip and sarcastic, and we think it's cool to kind of shut down the warm fuzzy, the love. We think it's cool to, to be egoistic, but it's not. When we're vulnerable, we open our hearts, and we help others. It improves our immune systems and increases the level of happiness. All right, I'm going to wind down with these six points. Alignment versus enrollment. Lovingly allow mistakes. Seek for forensic forgiveness. Watch your thoughts. Emote often and be authentic. Alignment versus enrollment. Alignment is like somebody trying to talk you into doing business with you without ever knowing your pain point. Enrollment is sharing your pain with each other, and then you align with that pain, and then you discuss what are the opportunities that I might be able to help uh, change in your life, how can I bring opportunity by looking and feeling, looking at and feeling your pain? Align with people. Don't try to enroll them. I see this in religions all the time. I see it all the time. You know, I'm Buddhist. Everything is Buddha. Everything Buddha. I am Islam. It's nothing but Islam. I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? That's not, that's not alignment. It's enrollment. If all those are based in love, talk about love. Align with love. Lovingly allow mistakes, but don't be a doormat. You have to let people make mistakes. Doesn't mean you can't be tough. Almost done. Two minutes. Forensic forgiveness. Spend time crying, being angry. Look at the, the images that have upset you in your life. Don't let, them, don't let them fade into a compartment. Look at them. Focus on them. Get the emotions out. Without emotions, there's no wisdom. Watch your thoughts. Thoughts create reality. Emote often. Pound the earth. Without those emotions, you cannot achieve wisdom. Be authentic. Today's corporate lingo is garbage. Ignore it. Break free. Speak your truth. Be clearly and fully who you are. Be sloppy if necessary. Let it all out. Always be you. Final thoughts. The past is a canceled check. It, it just doesn't exist any longer. There's no basis for its existence, so you're going to have to let it go at some point. Your contract is not with individuals. It's with the universe. This means that at any time, you can make a change in a relationship or a pursuit, and you don't necessarily have to tell anybody. Your contract is with the universe. The only person you can change, affect, control, push, transform, and interact with is you. That's because we're all one. Any reflection that we're interacting with is something we have to master. It's always just you. So this is the closing piece. Just for 15 seconds, I ask as a group if we could possibly just look at something in our lives in this moment and possibly choose forgiveness, choose a new path, choose a new feeling. I'd like just in the quiet of your own mind and hearts, if you made some shift today, some bold choice, around vulnerability, something that feels courageous. I gently and lovingly ask that of each of you in this moment. Only you know what that is. So let it all go. I'm a coach. I do live shows around the world. I do full workshops. Fitting into 15 minutes is very difficult for me. And I wrote a book, which I'm giving out free copies. 
It's all about startups. I think I still have some left. I also am an intuitive and I coach a lot of executives and I help them see themselves clearly and find their vulnerability so that they can have a full life. And I created my own cards and my own books around personalities and they're very fun. My company's creativelab.tv and I love to help startups. You are the embodiment of love. I'm grateful that you let me encourage you toward a little bit of a different kind of business presentation today. Stay in gratitude. Feel free to be in touch. Thank you very much.